like to thank Commissioner Pernetti for his leadership. It's been strong um, from jump. Our conversations have been awesome, and uh, watching him with the coaches last night control the room and um, really stimulate uh, incredible conversations we look forward has, has been awesome to see. So thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to start, you know, our, our kids, our coaches are very committed to the city of Birmingham, and we've been saddened this month. Our, our city took a big blow to start the month with uh, multiple homicides, a mother, a five-year, five-year-old child, um, a shooting at a birthday party. And, and why I mention that is because our kids have fallen in love with our city. Uh, in my 18 months as the head coach, we've served over 2,500 hours in the community. Uh, it's part of our mission of Serve, Grow, Launch. And it hurts our kids when they're in the community trying to unify, trying to bring people together, trying to be the hero for these young people. And, and we see the violence that's going on. So um, from our perspective, that, that's been a, it's been a tough month that way. And uh, although we're getting ready for a season, uh, our kids have a maturity to them, an awareness to them that is, is pretty impressive um, to, to feel for the city. Uh, we have a great mayor. Uh, he's doing everything in his power to uh, bring healing to our city, and, and we hope to be a big part of that. Uh, excited to be back. You know, in, in my life as an NFL quarterback, four and eight usually gets you fired. Um, somehow they held on to me. So uh, it was a tough year, humbling, um, which is a good thing. I think uh, anytime you go through really low valleys and you embrace it and you own it, you can learn a lot from it. Uh, I did, our players did. Uh, we have two incredible players here with us uh, these couple days. Jacob Zeno, our quarterback, who in his first year was highly productive, was in the top five in completion percentage in the country, one of the more efficient passers in the country, um, did a really nice job for us and, and uh, a really good human as well. And then Michael Moore, um, inside linebacker for us, uh, physically very gifted, uh, a position switch guy when we got there. Uh, so he was learning on the fly last year. Uh, finished the season, um, banged up a little bit, but done a great job in the off season, uh, getting his body ready um, to play a complete season this year. They're, they're great. They're great kids. I hope you get a chance to talk to them and uh, get to know them beyond football. I think both of them have a chance to play professional football, um, but more importantly, they're going to make a difference in the communities they live in and and uh, be professionals to something, and be very successful. So. Um, you know, I, I think I get asked this question a lot, what did I learn in my first year? And I knew I stood here last year and I said, I'm going to learn a lot. Uh, I had not coached at this level. I had not only coached in high school football. My football journey had been different than most. And uh, I learned a ton. But I think the biggest thing was an affirmation. As the narrative of college football right now becomes, and I've heard it 50 times, in the 12 hours I've been here, 24 hours I've been here, that this is about money. And I would strongly, strongly disagree with that statement. Um, my long football life started on the back of a blocking sled for my dad, who was an offensive line coach, um, to college football, Heisman Trophy candidate, first round pick, ter worst player in the National Football League, Super Bowl champion, analyst, high school coach. One thing's never changed about football, it's about connections and relationships. And I don't want it to get lost that we have a burden as coaches to connect with these young people, to establish lifelong relationships with them, to be mentors for them, to be transparent and honest with our mistakes with them, to help lead them and guide them. Uh, many of us did not grow up with our identity being shaped by this thing. And that's what young people are, are dealing with right now. And why mental health is so such a big topic is because could you imagine having your identity shaped by the things you saw on Instagram? It's really easy to criticize. It's very hard to have empathy for what these kids are going through. I have three collegian. I have raised three collegian athletes, um, all big time college volleyball players. I saw the struggles that they went through and their teammates. And when I went into this, I made sure that although. You know, some may say they like to win more and hate to lose more. That's all horse crap. Um, it can't override what we're doing, the burden, the responsibility we have with these kids. Uh, and we take it incredibly serious as a staff. Uh, the entire building um, wakes up every single morning with, every, with on their boards in handwriting by me, relentless engagement. 
We're going to relentlessly engage these young people. We're going to try to pull out every bit of talent on the football field, but we're also going to try to help them reach their potential off the field, and, and I will never change that. Um, so please, as we have these discussions about money, which is very real, and I applaud what's going on. I, I, I agree with Commissioner Pernetti that it's exciting that the student athletes have a chance to um, benefit more uh, from the product they put on the field. Uh, it's second to the relationships that uh, we're establishing with them and the opportunity we have to help shape and mold their lives. So with that, I will take some questions. All right. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone over to you. Let's start right there in the front row and right to your right. Uh, Coach, with the recent success of basketball uh, at your school, have, have you seen the NIL been able to reciprocate both for your program and the basketball team? And also, is there any bit of pressure to kind of match the program since they just uh, made the NCAAs last season? Yeah, Andy's an incredible coach, become a really dear friend in a short amount of time. Somebody I've learned a lot from. He's a man. He's a fantastic coach, leader, builder, developer. Um, you know, NIL is something that, you know, it's a reality we're all facing. Um, some of us have the opportunity to generate a lot of um, money for the collective. Some of us don't. It really doesn't. I mean, you're not going to write an article that we're not going to be judged. The rankings at the end of the year isn't going to have an asterisk. They had this much NIL money, right? So uh, it's really nothing I can control. Um, do I fundraise relentlessly? Yes. Does Andy fundraise relentlessly? Yes. Are we as successful as some others? I don't know. You know, I really, I try not to listen to what other people are saying. Um, we're trying to work with our collective to uh, help our student athletes be compensated in a, in a way that is appropriate. Uh, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can't. I, I do think that again on this topic, you know, a student athlete feels valued in more ways than just economically. Um, we've been able to recruit some really fine players that were offered a lot more money elsewhere because they felt the value of not just we were able, the collector was able to help them in one way economically, but a, a fraction of what they're offered other places. But they also feel valued by opportunity. They also feel valued by connection. And that's the formula that we're working off of. It's a formula that I'm, I got you know, all my chips down on um, for it to work because, you know, if a player comes to you because you paid him the most money, right? Money makes you more of what you were before you got it. And I would argue I probably got more money than anybody in this room at a young age. And it was not very good for me. I was immature, maybe more immature. I was complacent, it made me more complacent. Um, I can go on and on and on. So I lived it and I'm not about to make sure the value of a human being is simply in the economics around him or her. I want that person, yes, I do think they should be compensated. I think there's a, there's a, there's a price um, or there's a value attached to their skill level and the impact they can have in your organization. Um, but I only want that to be a third of it. There's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to compete, maybe play sooner, uh, maybe highlight it. I mean, our offense is better than most. If you're an offensive player, you're probably going to want to come play for us. Um, our defense stunk. You know, it's going to be hard to get defensive players if you go off last year. Um, but there's opportunity there, too. If you're a young defensive player, you're a player in the portal on defense, and you see a defense that's stunk, you're like, well, I don't stink. I can come help build something there. Okay, so there's opportunity. And then when you walk in our building and, you know, the, the connection we make, we don't recruit, we connect. Um, we get to know everything about the young person, his family. Um, we do a very strong vetting on the type of player we're recruiting, and, and we want to make sure they're relational as well. Uh, I ask every parent of every recruit the permission to co-parent with them um, because I think that's a role that I have to take on. Um, I've raised three. I've lost one. Uh, I have a lot of um, empathy, again, towards parents and, and the challenges there, especially. I remember when I dropped my oldest off at Notre Dame to play volleyball, I had to pull over on the side of the road. I was getting ready to hit that highway to drive back to Chicago to take a flight out of Chicago, and I couldn't drive. You know, I was crying so much. I was devastated. This is my baby. Well, every one of these kids that comes to place for me, that's their baby. And uh, it's my responsibility to co-parent with them. So, again, I, I'm not 
turning a blind eye that economics is a big driver of some of this stuff, but it can't be for us. And, and I don't want to build this program on making kids more what they were before they got it, knowing what I went through. All right, next question will be to the far right. Uh, Coach Trey Smith, College Underdogs. You got Arkansas early in the season. Last year you had Georgia early in the season. UAB has not shied away from scheduling SEC opponents. And in fact, last year, I know this probably means nothing to you as a coach, but y'all played the number one team better than some of their own conference opponents. What is your philosophy with that playoff access and that playoff spot being on the line as far as scheduling goes? You know, the team that got in a year ago did not have any games of that caliber. You as a head coach, is it important to continue having games like that on the schedule, you know, at the highest level of competition, or would you rather have one that's similar to the team last year that might be more feasible to getting wins to getting in that spot? So a lot, a lot to unpack there. I'll start with, uh, I have nothing to do with our schedule. <laughs> I'm the newbie. Uh, I did in the interview process ask uh, Mark Ingram or AD, you know, what was his philosophy? And he agreed with the SEC opponents. Obviously, it's a good payday for the school, which we need. Um, so I, I agree with that. I would like to play an SEC opponent every year. There's only one way to win. It doesn't have shortcuts. There are no snooze buttons, no excuses, and no days off. It's a spirit to outwork, outsmart, and outlast the competition. It demands boldness, grit, and guts. It produces courage and resilience. Um, but the fact that you chose to climb Everest says something. So when you get to the top, there's more satisfaction there. Um, I remember when I was a high school coach and I took that job, that team was in the dust, you know, and they were scared to, you know, play their sisters. And I immediately went around and started calling all the best programs in the state of Tennessee and outside the state of Tennessee. And, and they thought I was crazy. And I said, well, no, we need to be hardened by this, you know, and if we end up being as good as I think we're going to be, we'll beat them. You know, we'll find a way to beat them. It may not be year one, may not be year two, but eventually, We'll beat them, and we played the dominant program in Middle Tennessee my second year in a lightning storm and played them pretty well, lost the game, but it's amazing what happened after that game. You know, I want to say we lost one game in three years after that. So uh, I do think you should play great opponents. I don't think you should be scared of them. Um, I do think it's a flaw that you don't get weighted by the CFP for uh, a quality loss. You know, I think... Uh, um, SMU was at Oklahoma last year. Uh, you know, they played their tails off. We watched that game and, and was like, man, I, I, you would argue SMU was the better team that day. Um, that should have been rewarded, uh, in my opinion. But uh, we'll continue to not shy away from anybody. I've told Golish we'll play USF in the Walmart parking lot if he wants a doubleheader. You know, I just think that's the way we're wired. Um, uh, again, I, I get a little on my high horse when people avoid competition. You know, when you've lived my life, you chase it. You chase hard things. You chase challenges. You uh, face the lion face to face. You don't run away from the lion. So um, that's the approach of our program. And, and uh, I think the conference has that approach too, which I'm really proud of. We do one last one on the right there. You notice I do these long answers. So that's a media trick I learned a long time ago. So you have to answer less questions. Long answers equal less questions. Hey, Coach. Um, you talked about struggles on the defensive side of the ball. I'm, I'm right here. Sorry. I can't see it. Yeah, there you go. Um, you talked about struggles on the defensive side of the ball and moving Michael Moore from the edge to the inside linebacker position. How do you expect his role to evolve on the defense this year? He's, a, he's an NFL athlete. So his length, his athleticism, ability to bend, versatility to play inside against the run, to move on the edge, to cover – to extend versus these open sets is invaluable. You have to have this type of player to play any type of good defense. Uh, I know when we play teams and we can extend your stiff player into space or a shorter player, a player that lacks length, that we have a massive advantage there. Um, so, but I think more important is what we've done around them. You know, we signed 21 players out of the portal. 
Uh, I think 14 of those are on defense. Uh, I expect all 14 to contribute. I mean, there's a possibility we'll have nine new defensive starters this year. Uh, we lost one. We lost a very, very good player uh, to UCF, but was able to replace him with an equally good player, I believe. Um, so, you know, I if you look at my track record in football and winning, I was never the... <laughs> I wasn't the reason we won. Uh, I was a... Um, a supporting actor to a great defense and I am mindset on building a, a very good defense. It may not happen this year. You know, we may be, we may be a product uh, in the works this year, um, but we have been steadfast on looking at our defense very critically, um, owning how terrible we were last year and going to work to fix it. It was the first thing we talked about when the season was over. Uh, it's been countless sleepless nights trying to rebuild it and we feel like we've done a good job putting our position putting ourselves in a position to where we can put a really good defense out there. All right, thank you, thank you so much. You.